Welcome. Welcome to our Black History Month kickoff. Um, I want to thank our president, um, our vice president. I want to thank all those that contributed to this event. Um, my name is Jason Seals. I am the department chair of ethnic studies. I've been here for about 10 years. Um, and this month, we really wanted to focus on the black family and thinking about how does the black family um, move forward. Um, and so Black History Month is really a time around reflection, learning and celebration. And so we all have to start this month um, acknowledging Dr. Carter G. Woodson. By a show of hands, how many folks have heard of Dr. Carter G. Woodson? A few people, right? So Dr. Carter G. Woodson wrote the book, The Miseducation of the Negro in 1933. And it's a relevant book in terms of understanding the plight and the experience of people of African ancestry. And Dr. Woodson created Black History Month, um, and this is start off as a Black History Week. And he really wanted to celebrate two things. One, Frederick Douglass and all that he did, and also Abraham Lincoln in terms of some of the policy work that he implemented um, before the, pro the, the proclamation of emancipation took place. And so it's always important to acknowledge Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Now, as I go through this lecture slash discussion, I think it's important to be able to have some understanding of a few terms. One, the concept that we have up here is African. When I say African, I'm usually referring to people of African ancestry throughout the world. Um, when we say African American, we're thinking about people of African ancestry born here in North America. When we say um, African, we're referring to people of African ancestry um, born on the continent. And sometimes when we use the word black, we're talking about all people throughout the diaspora, right? So throughout the world, because we know that the slave ships actually stopped throughout the world. And so it's important to make the connection of historical lineage, but also just recognize people have been scattered and displaced. Make sense? So we call this a forum. And so being that it's a forum, it's really a place so we can exchange ideas. And so there's gonna be some space for you all to be able to ask some questions, pose some thoughts, even offer some solutions. And so we have to look at both historically and modern day, what is the experience of African people as it relates to the family experience? And so this should be an exchange. So if you have some questions, I see folks are writing, write those things down and there'll be an opportunity for us to share. The black family is, is not monolithic. You know, it's multicultural now. Um, we can call it the African American family. Um, it, you know, it looks like, in certain ways, the Obamas. You know, uh, a biracial man, a, a African American woman, and kids that are have some measure of, of 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 mixed cultural background and mixed grandparentage and all of that. But what I, but the most disturbing thing for me, when with regards to um, traditionally underrepresented groups, the African American family, et cetera, are the young people that I work with through my foundation, the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation. Three out of every four young person I work with is being raised um, by a single parent, usually a m mother. We can talk about all the different socioeconomic factors, sociological factors, and all sorts of things that have, that have, that have transpired over the course of that, and whether uh, t having two parents in the home is really the the most important thing. I believe that you have the best results when you have two parents in the home. Certainly economically you do. Uh, all the research bears out that when you have two parents in the home, the family saves more, does better, etc. Yet in many African American families we don't have that and, and it's something that I think that all of us have to take a look at. In my book The Conversation I talk about the, the black family and, and different elements and aspects of it and talk about how um, over time there's been this dissolution of, of, of the African-American family in certain ways. Some of the problems go back to uh, slavery. And when you had the purposeful uh, uh, disintegration of a family unit where purposefully the wives and the parents were separated from themselves, the husband's wives separated, separated from the kids as well. And so th th some people think that there's a holdover sociological element there. Some other people believe that during the, the industrial Revolution and through the 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 the, the, in, the onset of certain types of welfare laws, 
where it was almost encouraged in certain low-income communities for there not to be a male in the home because certain amounts of monies uh, and food stamps, et cetera, were not given if there was a working male in the home. So number one, either had the male moving out of the house or it had the male not working, which are obviously two not great results for the family unit. So based on what you all heard, <clears throat> what were some of the things that stood out to you all in terms of uh, the experience of African-American families? Right, so there's a push in terms of government subsidies to have a man outside of the home, right? So having a man outside of the home actually allowed the government to now give funding. And so that created this interesting dynamic around having a family bond, having two parents in the home, and how does that begin to impact children, relationships, and so forth, right? Well, I think we have to go back historically, right? So World War II um, changed the dynamic of what was happening in the community. So you had white men, white women, black men going to war overseas. A lot of the men weren't allowed to actually physically fight in the war for a long period of time. They were more laborers um, in terms of the war, working in mess halls and things of that nature. Some actually trained. And then later in 1948, the integration happened where now folks can actually be a part of the military and there were certain branches that allow folks to actually engage in what we consider to be fighting, combat. Um, but what we saw was a lot of those women began to work in the community. And so when the war was over, it was very, very difficult for men of African ancestry to get jobs. And so now it shifts who was the breadwinner, who was the person that was at the forefront of creating a living for that family. And so historically, since that time period, we've seen it actually be more difficult for men of African ancestry to gain employment, and that hasn't always been the case for African American women. And I think we have to look at um, what is the perception of. Right, so who is the person sitting um, in that chair that gets to say, you know, are you qualified for this job? And how are they perceiving you when you first walk in based on color, based on clothing? What has he or she learned about that group of people before they sit down? And then now that informs how they see that person. Is that person, you know, uh, qualified? What's their capacity? Has any stereotypes informed, you know, how that person shows up? And so all of those things we have to be mindful of. So when Hill Harper's talking about this historical experience, I think it's important for us to be mindful of it. One, because we have to say what has informed the experience of the family. And then two, I think it's important that we know what is the historical narrative, right? Historical narrative because I would argue that the historical narrative has actually overshadowed the comprehensive narrative of Africans. The historical narrative tends to be very negative. Most of the ideas that are articulated or images that are disseminated about people of African ancestry, in particular the family, are negative. So when you study in fields of education, psychology, sociology, when they're examining the family of African ancestry, there are negative ideas that tend to be at the forefront and less about the strengths, less about the assets, less about what are the things that are pushing the family to be so resilient that after 400 years of slavery, folks are still here. Or we'll point to this idea, well, we have single parent households, right? Single parent households, we have to be very mindful, isn't a new phenomenon. It is a new, new phenomenon across the board for people of all ethnicities. And then we talk about people of African ancestry, there's been single homes since the enslavement of Africans. Does that mean the family has been less strong? Does it mean the family has been less connected? No, it's a problem, but it hasn't decimated the black family. And I think that's where we have to actually begin to pick up the narrative and shift it. Does that make sense? So this, this is the modern day reality, right? This is the modern day reality. Only 37, we can go mean about 38% of African American minors live in both family households. And I think a lot of times when we have uh, statistics, we often take that statistic and create a story around that statistic. How many folks have ever done research before? When you do research, you can actually begin to dictate the outcomes, right? So who's your sample size, right? So this says African-American minors, right? 
this forum is about black families. When I say black, as I spoke up before, that term encompasses all people of African ancestry. One of the things that I feel often gets lost is that when we see people of African ancestry, we pretty much just clump everybody together and we never really know who's who. And so when they start creating stats like this, who are they identifying as African American? Is it just people that identify as that? Is it based on perception? But I also think this number in itself says something negative when we look at just that number. What is the narrative behind that number? How did that number come about? What's the number of men and women that have been incarcerated that made that number real? We know that since crack into the black community in the late 70s, early 80s, that the prison rate quadrupled over four times over, right? And so I think it's important to be mindful of that, but then as I spoke up before, understand what are the things that still permeate that make the family strong even as that number is there? Does that number in itself make the family pathological? Does that number in itself make the family weak? Does that number in itself make where students and young people that are coming out of those homes aren't able to succeed? Those are the questions that have to be asked along with the stats, not just looking at the stat and then making an assumption about the stats. Make sense? So Joe Fagan um, is a scholar and an educator over at Texas A&M, and he wrote a book, well, many books, but one of the books he wrote was a book called Racist America. Now, Joe Fagan says that over time, white America has combined a belief integrating cognitive elements, meaning the brain, Racial interpretations, meaning ideals, symbols, narratives, visuals, and auditory elements, racialized images, and language accents, feelings, and inclination to discriminate. He calls this the white racial frame. He says that we have been exposed to ideas that are negative that creates a negative understanding of people. And so when you think about the early images of people of African ancestry during enslavement, Anybody know what those images were? During slavery, the depiction of people of African ancestry were actually happy enslaved Africans. People were shown as being happy to be enslaved. Why was that? It was to normalize and to rationalize that this is okay, that no one is being harmed, that this population of people are actually enjoying servitude. Now, the images you speak of in terms of people, you know, being extremely dark, um, people having these phenotypical features that don't really represent people in their humanity, those came later. But even right at the end of slavery, the images went from being very docile to accepting of slavery to being very aggressive. And the reason being is because during slavery, we, there was a uh, attitude that people were accepting, but when you have somebody actually enslaved, it keeps them subservient. It keeps them in a second class status. Now, how do you maintain that when slavery ends? Create a hostile, aggressive person, so then people still interact with folks as though they are aggressive to maintain what? Them being subservient, even though there's not a system in place anymore. And so it's really important to understand this historical idea has created a narrative that existed during that time period, but I would say even impacts people now because when people are killed by cops in modern day, it's not modern day images that's creating the fear and hysteria amongst cops. It's actually historical ideas and images that people are bombarded with that makes them feel fear, makes them feel that people are animal-like, beast-like, because these are ideas that have permeated historically that have people have taken on. When I'm watching sports, I'm always very mindful of how the commentators are saying, oh, he's playing like a beast. I'm like, ugh, that's not a good idea. Because that idea of beast in itself has meant animal-like historically for African people. So then when a cop hears that, as he or she sits on their couch on Saturday or Sunday, depending on if they're watching college football or NFL, then they go to work on Monday, they make that same association. There's not a differentiation. So we have to be mindful of how those narratives play out. I wanna watch a video really quick that shows this in example so we can get more understanding. It's a brief clip called Ethnic Notions. Any immediate thoughts about that clip? 
always show propaganda similar to how they did the Jews in Nazi Germany? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when you create um, certain testing, ideas testing. about people, it then um, informs how people should treat them. So when we talk about the white racial frame, it's not just an idea that is um, a reflection of white America. People outside of white America adopt those ideas and then begin to treat whatever group the narrative is about in such a way. And so when we think about this, they made, an, they made a distinction between character and caricatures. A character is just a role that someone plays. A caricature is a demeaning idea or image about someone it's to belittle them, to see them as being less than human. And one of the things that I think is really important for people to be mindful of is I show this historical ideas and talk about these historical ideas as a way for us to understand modern day. You can't understand modern day without understanding the historical context that have gotten us to present day. And so we talk about ethnic notions, we talk about slavery, because these are reference points for us to understand Joe Fagan's idea of the racial frame, but then also the treatment, also the pathology. Even when we get to this piece of the Moynihan Report, right? So some of you all have studied sociology, and if you study sociology, the Moynihan Report has come up about this idea of people of African ancestry being innately inferior based on them not engaging in the nuclear family unit, which has typically been something that reflects European or Western culture. For African people or communal folks, typically it's been the extended family. Folks are connected beyond the nuclear. Folks are connected to fictive kin. Folks you've been on a long time, no blood relation, but that's your auntie, that's your cousin, that's your sister, that's your brother. Fictive kin. Folks are connected to you know extended family members such as uncles and cousins that live outside the home, but the, the idea was is that they function as a unit and as a collective to have healthy connectivity, to support child rearing, to support healthiness and the relationship between the folks that are leading. And so it's important to understand this historical context because it helps us to now look more critically about what's being said about the family, how folks are being treated. There's a few hands I want to acknowledge, right? Ms. Jackson, you help me out with this? So are you, were you done with it? it I was just thinking how you said the, the, pic, the depiction changed from being, um, it d changed from being one where there was the happy slave to now that these people are uh, free, now they're lazy, they're violent, they're this and that. And it continues today. Like if you look at shows like Love and Hip Hop or something like that, they're showing the people as uh, lazy, right. um, hypersexualized, violent, always fighting, bickering among each other, mm -hmm. nothing positive. Right. And then it's so so much to the point that black people and everybody tunes in and want to be on it and want to participate when it's really a negative thing. Right. Absolutely. Appreciate that. It's like mostly also because like white people are also making fun of African American people and other religious people thinking they can't do it, but we literally can. Yeah. It just they think the white people think like they're smarter than everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with um, there are some ideas that permeate in one culture. Um, from almost a, what we call a superior stance. And I think we have to be mindful that when we're dealing with oppression, we're dealing with people's humanity being, being negated or being dismissed. What I was gonna say that I noticed in the video, cause you were talking about like, not only is it like the structure in white America, but like other groups that aren't white America take it and like internalize it. And I was saying, I noticed in the video when she was washing the clothes, like the mammy was obviously, she was like really big and like dark, but there was also a lighter skinned woman who came along and you could tell that she was black, but they made her pretty. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that that kind of aided in how far racism has got because we've internalized it and in ourselves we've been like, oh, well, you look like this, so you're bad, and you look like this, so you're good. And that just aids in the scheme or whatever of racism. Like, I don't know how to say what else I meant to say, but yeah. Absolutely. I think what you're bringing up is important in terms of colorism, 
um, how there are some ideas around folks being of lighter complexion and their value or ideas around beauty um, and folks being darker and how that might depict them as being criminal or violent or less attractive. And there's two films that come to mind historically that kind of reinforce what you're talking about. One is Birth of a Nation, um, not the newer film, but the, 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 the historical film. It was actually a silent film, and it was, it was taking place um, during a time period of the Civil War, and it was particularly just about um, black families. Um, but the black family that was depicted was actually a white family in blackface. And when the war happened, um, the black people somewhat kind of lost their minds and the black men were depicted in the film chasing after white women as brutal savages. And you can imagine that this whole film was, um, was silent. And so when something's silent, what happens? That means you have to kind of create the narrative for yourself. And so that was the first film. The other film was Gone with the Wind, which is a very popular film. Um, and basically there was a black woman that looked like the mammy image in Ethnic Notions, and she was freed, and because she liked you know, her family so much, even after she was freed from slavery, she stayed. And so this became, these ideas began to perpetuate a certain notion that America wanted people to understand about black people, and people adopted these ideas. So I was just going to ring the sentiment of my sister up here. Um, what's important for us all to understand that not only these historical socializations shaping the ideologies and values of non-blacks, but we also internalize these consistently perpetuated images and propaganda. Um, Brother Jason, you have to help me out. I can't remember if it was Dr. Amos Wilson or Wade Nobles who brought up menticide, but I feel like... Dr. Amos Wilson. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Amos Wilson. Um, these images that we internalize and then reinforce in our behaviors and our morals and our values continue to feed into the pathology of our state of blackness. So um, definitely after we were removed from chattel enslavement, we are familiar with reconstruction and how that failed and then we moved into the Jim Crow era. Um, Michelle Alexander coined the term the new Jim Crow. Um, menticide has consistently stayed. So even when we were liberated from the physical shackles, our brain was still trained to think the same way it was when we were forced and brought here and forced into uh, chattel enslavement. So I just wanted to mention that, thank you. Definitely. I appreciate those comments because they definitely reinforce what we're talking about. So for folks that are, that are here as students and learners, I think it's important for you to be mindful of these myths, right? Myths being untruths, falsehoods that have continued. Some of them have, have their origin in this historical narrative that we're talking about. So this idea of the inferior family, we talk about the Moynihan Report. Um, and you can go and you look at this inherent instability, right? And so here's some stats up here that are really important. So we have this stat here that says, um, 1968, most African-American families lived in two-parent households. How many folks knew that? A few people, right? This is 68, right? How many folks was born in the 80s? 90s? 2000s? All right. <laughs> I just want, I had to make sure I put it out there, all right? So, my mother was born in 58, okay? I was born in 78. I just think about the reality is that this is not that long ago, right? Crack entered the community in the late 70s, early 80s. We got here, 75% of African-American households were headed by married couples. This included extended family members. 1970s, only 25% of families were headed by women, which is interesting because this number here is actually higher in modern day because of, we look at the crack epidemic, we also look at mass incarceration of people of African ancestry, but it wasn't normal. It wasn't normal. I spoke of earlier that it isn't new, but it wasn't normal to have a woman raising children by themselves. Look at this stat here. This is probably the most alarming stat. The late 1800s to the 1960s, close to 70% of black children were born to married couples. Now, you got to think about that time period. What year did slavery end? 1865, supposedly. We know the slave ships came all the way to 1867 in North America, all the way to 1881 in parts of South America. 
So we know that slavery ended in this time period in the 1800s. So what this stat, this stat conveys that the black family, in terms of having two parents, actually was enduring something worse and had more stability based on two parents than in modern day. Because we're looking at, in terms of the modern day, we're looking at from the 70s to we're in 2018. We're, this is, slavery is in here, reconstruction's in here, the Great Depression's in here, the Great Migration's in here. There's a lot of things happening here, but there's still a connectivity. At the end of slavery, people actually went and walked. There was no bus, there was no BART, okay? People walked to find their family members. One of the things about Harriet Tubman to me that was uh, so revolutionary about her is yes, she made 20 trips from the South to the North and freed people, but she also found all of her family members. And it was against the law for people to be married during slavery, against the law. But people wanted to be married because it was a part of the culture of African people. So when people were free from slavery, in some states it costs money to actually get married and people spent that money to ensure that their union was acknowledged by the state because it was so important for them to be in a connected union. These are stories that don't get told. And so this is important. So when this idea that folks are like inherently, when something's inherent, it means you're born with. But if you're only focused on modern day and you go back to that stat I showed that had 38% of children are born or living in you know, a two-parent household, if you only focus on that, you don't know the narrative of how do we get here. And some people think that, oh, well, it was always like this. So we have to go beyond this. Another myth that African-American males do not contribute to the family. This is so normalized. Some of, my, um, some of my schooling is in psychology. I spent years in psychology. And so there's a lot of pathologizing of black men, that black men are absent, black men are not in the home. Now, we have to be mindful that some black men are not in the home because of mass incarceration. Mass incarceration didn't start in the 80s or the 90s. It's not a newer phenomenon. Mass incarceration started during slavery during slavery, and you, you can go, when, when slavery ended, you can look at chain gangs that started because mass incarceration was a part of creating a new labor force. Because when slavery ended, now you didn't have the free labor, so it was really important for now you to be able to actually re-enslave people to create a new labor force. This happened all throughout the South. And so if there were people that weren't present, it wasn't because they were just leaving or because they didn't have the morals or because they didn't want to be there. There were policies and practices in place to take people out of the home. The normalization of there not being two parents in the household is a newer phenomenon. Black men have been in a home. And I think the other piece is that just because somebody's not with the, the the, the person they had a child with doesn't mean they're not taking care of their child. I think because of the historical narrative, we assume certain things. Like I always tell people, think about this. Going back to Joe Fagan, how are people conditioned? If you see a white woman walking down the street with a stroller, most people automatically assume the husband is at work. We don't question that that man isn't present. If we see a black woman walking down the street with the stroller, we automatically assume he gone. See how that narrative works? You don't even know the story, but the story gets created for you because of the narrative. I was walking with my son one day, and the lady was like, oh, it's daddy day? Mind you, I had to keep my composure. And I'm like, it's daddy day every day. Because there's an idea that either I'm a weekend dad, or this is not my full-time job, or I'm not committed to this. Just because two people aren't together doesn't mean that that person isn't present, right? So this idea that people don't contribute, that people aren't present for their children, these falls into, into the same category as 
making some of these assumptions. And so these, these ideas, um, they come from this historical narrative that we're talking about. Now, are there certain people that aren't present? Absolutely. Are there some people that just not showing up for their kids? Absolutely. But I think what's important is that, as Hill Harper said in that film clip that we watch, we are not a monolith. What does that mean? It means that there is not one story that fits for all of us. Always tell people there's a spectrum of the black experience, meaning that there are several different experiences, but they're all black experiences. There isn't one. But what happens, a lot of times with the media, there's only one narrative that gets shown. It's the negative narrative. It isn't the positive narrative. Most of the things that is shown on TV are negative. I think about the most positive black shows on TV that's on cable or even regular TV tend to be negative. And then, you know, we're like, oh, well, we got like three of them. Well, in 2018, if you can only count three positive black shows on TV, that's a problem. That's a problem. And I just think about somebody, I don't know, growing up in, I don't know, Sri Lanka, and maybe they watching Love and Hip Hop, and they never experienced any interaction with people of African ancestry, that becomes the reference point. So being mindful of these things helps us to have a different understanding of the group. Other myths is like this hostile and or violent, um, don't value education, I've worked in education for years, been on this campus for 10 years, and the thing that always comes from a lot of teachers that black students don't wanna learn, black students can't perform. One, all students have the same capacity. Two, we have to be mindful that if you have schools that are failing students, it, it isn't the schools, it isn't the, the, the um, it, I'm sorry, it isn't the, the families or the children, it's the schools, if you can't, if, if a, if a if a parent entrusts their child to be educated and they go through that school for four years and they can't pass the exit exam, that's on the school. It's really important to be mindful of that. But then they say, okay, the dropout rate is high. Well, let's, if the dropout rate is high, why is the dropout rate high? Are people getting their academic needs met? Do people have economic responsibilities? Is it safe in the school? I've been a lot of these schools. I've worked in the McClymans, the Techs, the Casamans. I've been at Mac McClymans when there were gun shootings. And I've been at private schools where people feel safe. Those disparities create the realities for a lot of our students. So when there's high dropout rates, we just can't say folks are dropping out. What is the story behind the dropouts? These are all important things because when children are dropping out, who gets the blame? It's the parents. It's the parents that get looked at as being um, not prepared or not you know, nurturing or not the ones that want to see their children succeed. And so I think it's important to understand where are these untruths coming from and then how do they manifest itself in the sense of some of you all are students in here and you're going through school. You might be in child development. You might be in psychology. You might be in sociology. and you are the people that are gonna, be, that are gonna be creating the policies in the future. The Moynihan Report was important, not because a man did a report and created some ideas. What made it important is that the government took that, that document and said it was truth. So when you all are going through school, it's important for you to be mindful of your values, mindful of your ideas and where you got those ideas from, and really begin to study because if you don't study, then everything else around you will help to formulate your ideas about the black family, even black people. And it's interesting, I, I teach Afram, and I think the people that should be in those classes more than anybody else are people of African ancestry. They should be studying themselves. Just because you're a person of African ancestry doesn't mean that you know the whole experience of African people. You have to study to understand who you are historically. Remember, it was against the law to read and write. It was against the law for people to know about themselves. In terms of culture, you couldn't read, write, practice your spirituality or religion, use your language, engage in traditional practice that come from your ancestry. So it was basically against the law for you to be you. So if your parents didn't know who you was, then your parents taught you what they knew about who they were, and sometimes that could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what they knew. 
And then a lot of students, their first like introduction in terms of learning about who they are comes in the college setting. And they have to become aware of one's blackness. We talk about this in my black psych class. It's called negrescence. Negrescence is basically a process of becoming aware of one's blackness. And you gotta ask yourself a question. Why would a black person need to become aware of his or her blackness? Simple. There's been a practice, there's been policies, not even something that's foreign. If you go through a K through 12 school right here in Oakland, you're gonna learn very little about yourself and you might learn about our usual suspects like you know, you might get a little Martin Luther King and you only get a half truth about him because you typically you don't learn about who he really was. You learn about the image they want you to know about him. You learn about a little bit about Rosa Parks, maybe a little Sojourner Truth, depending on what school you went to, a little Malcolm X, but you're not learning the whole thing. And then they fell out the sky as slaves and then that's African American history. And those are the stories we carry with us. And so it's really important that if we're mindful of these things, we'll have a more holistic understanding of people of African ancestry. One of the things that we talk about in our program here at Merit is this concept of Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity. I see there was a few hands. Write those things down. I'm going to give you all some time to ask questions, right? Afrocentricity is this idea by Dr. Malefi Asante and Dr. Ama Mazama. They talk about that if you truly want to understand black people, then you must do what? You have to address all cultural, economic, political, and social questions related to African people using African ideas. You can't use Western ideas. You can't use CNN. You can't even use BET. You haven't been owned by black people for years. Right? You need to use African-centered ideas. What is that? There's ancient African ideas around who we are culturally. You can look at Mayotte, you can look at Dr. Marcia Sutherland's book, um, Black Authenticity. She talks about ancient African cultural traditions. She's talking about the traditions that existed with African people 3,000 years ago. Why 3,000 years ago? Great question. Because it's a time period that people were free of enslavement, free of Greek, Arab, Roman invasion, free of enslavement. We gotta go back 3,000 years to a time period that we weren't being attacked. And we don't say that Africa was a utopia, it wasn't perfect, but it was the healthiest reference point. So we study that time period to look, what were the methods, what were the practices to bring those forward to modern day so we can have healthiness. And so they offer this framework to say that us living here, we're biased. That those caricatures that was an ethnic notions, some of us believe those things. That when we see those violent behaviors in the media, we believe those things. That when we see that black woman walking down the street, we believe that she is without partner. We believe those things. So if we believe those things, it's hard for us to truly serve somebody in a healthy way. And so we have to look at what is impacting people through an Afrocentric lens. It's important for us to look at what are the strengths? What are the strengths? What are the things that we can leverage to say, these are the things that have supported people of African ancestry through the horrific time period that we had here? What are the things that have allowed us to be resilient and still be healthy and whole, strong kinship bond, strong kinship bond. We've always been a people that have believed in being connected, being connected. So it didn't matter if you had two parents, one parent, it didn't matter if you have the nuclear extended, we're good at creating family. There's people up here that you are in relationship with, no blood, that's your family. In your community, I think about one of the classic things you see in black families and when somebody's in a relationship with somebody and then you break up, that person's still family. So when you have family gatherings, they be showing up because they still family. Because the family didn't break up with them, you broke up with them. But that's family. They still be coming, you be like, oh, you could have told me they was coming. I didn't. But that's normal, right? And, and this, is what it, this is what's important. When you study 
families in West Africa, Ghana in particular, it's the same practice, that everybody's still family. This is why when Malcolm said, you're more African than you ever know, you just don't know what it means to be African, he's saying that there are practices that we have with us that we use on the daily that reflects our African culture, but we don't know it. So you can't, if you don't know it, then you can't reference it. You can't be intentional about using it. It just happened to be something that's a part of you. And so it's really important to kind of be mindful of those cultural things. We look at strong work orientation. This is why I tell people, don't use lazy. I don't care how you're feeling. People of African ancestry can never be lazy. We didn't build up too many things. We didn't make too many contributions. This, this idea of being lazy, I know, I know people, think about this. And I always, I'm always, I'm looking at all the brothers in here. The brothers in here, how many of y'all know how to, build, how to build a house? Anybody know how to build a house in here? Nobody. It's, it's not a knock, but I just think about 40 years ago, you could not be in a room with a black man and them not all know how to build a house. It was normal. People built houses all the time. Because it was something in terms of being able to take care of your family. We've moved out of the labor like industry, and that's why people can't raise their hand. I said to somebody that I was like, I wish I knew how to build a house. Because I'll just build a house. For my family, for homeless folks, for the community. But we built this country. And think about this. It doesn't really matter at what time period you start. Whether you start 1492 or 1419, you can go 1500s. People of African ancestry have worked for free for 300 plus years, for free. And at the end of slavery, built up every historical black college with the exception of Howard by hand. We built schools. So when now people say, oh, we don't want to learn, why do we build our own schools? Went on to build our own institutions, invent stuff like the stoplight. You know, you can go down this all the inventions. The cell phone, the first patent of the cell phone was actually created by a black man. Give thanks. You couldn't be on Tumblr or Snapchat and Twitter and all everything else without that, right? So it's important to acknowledge these things. Adaptability and family roles, so important. It means that everybody has a role in governing the family. That, you, yes, you might have a mom and a dad, but it doesn't mean that the man has more say-so over the woman. If you are a person that was the oldest child, let me see those hands, the oldest child. Typically, if you have, if you're in the family where there's adaptability happening and you're the oldest child, that means you cook some dinner. That means you didn't watch some kids. Because when parents weren't there, you became, you, you was the parent in charge. When the parents are gone, you in charge. You checking homework. You making sure people are in line. And then soon your mom or your dad come back home, you fall back into place. It meant that there were more than one income. Because everybody played a part. But that adaptability actually supported people actually having more connectivity, feeling responsible, doing what they need to do to ensure healthiness in the family. High achievement orientation. This is interesting because this strength comes from people being downtrodden for so long, people being told that they're inferior, people being told they couldn't do things. And so if you think about the time period of like 1800 till about 1872, just look it up for yourself. You can Google it on your phone, right? Um, all the inventions that were created because people wanted to prove who they were, but achievements aren't even new. That's why when Obama became president, I was confused on why people was excited because he wasn't even the first black president, just in North America. And then if you do ancestry, it, you, can't, you can't even count that because there were people that had African ancestry long before him that was the president of the US and we always been accomplishing things. It's not a new thing. We even need to be mindful that accomplishments are actually old. What, we were, what we're trying to get to is collective success, not individual success. Collective achievement, not individual achievement. It's like this thing, if you're doing well, but your family not doing well, then you're not doing well. Say that again. If you're doing well, but your family not doing well, then you're not doing well. 
That's important because that's a collective view, right? This religious and spirituality, if you look at almost any movement of African people in terms of changing quality of life, in terms of resistance, it's always been led by the spirit or by religion. It's been, regardless of how you feel about it, it's actually been a place of strength in our community. Now the church looks a lot different in modern day than it did 40 years ago. During the civil rights movement, on plantation. Because when you think about Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, these were all spiritual men that fought against the institution of slavery. It is actually a part of African American culture to resist. It's a part of the culture. Now there's different ways of resisting, but understanding resistance is important. So these are the strengths of the family, and I'm, I'm bringing these up because a lot of times, like I'm often called to go to USF and I'm talking to new therapists. They're gonna be working with families. And I'm, off, off, I'm always encouraging them, before you start working with a family, do what I call an evaluation assessment. What is that? You wanna figure out what strengths that family has. What are the assets of that family? Don't just come in and be like, oh, this is the problem. What are the assets? What are the strengths? What is allowing that family to be present in modern day? And allow those things to govern how you work with them. Don't allow the negativity, the images, all of the hashtags on uh, Instagram. And I'm always bringing up those modern day things up because it doesn't matter if it's on TV or not. People say, like, oh, I don't watch TV. That's cool, it's everywhere. You can, you can hashtag, n-word, be like, and all different type of images are gonna come up. Brother right here, in my, it was in my class last semester, did a brilliant uh, presentation um, examining Twitter and how Twitter is like disconnecting black men and black women, just looking at some of the things that's being put out there. So it's really important that we examine the strengths to know these things, to utilize these things, to create what we want. So then for me, the question becomes, how do we change the state of the black family? How do we change the state? So there's a few hands that went up. I'm gonna let those hands answer their questions, and then I'm gonna answer this to the best of my ability. Make sense? So I just wanted to know about the religious and spirituality aspect. So wasn't, um, wasn't Christianity like banned during slavery time? Because if you were a Christian, you couldn't be a slave. So they didn't allow African Americans to be slaves? I mean, to be Christians? So great question. So when people of African ancestry were brought here, they had their own spirituality, their own faith. That in itself was removed from them. They couldn't practice their own culture. And then for a time period, they could not practice anything. But then around 1717, there was what we call a Christianizing effort. Now this was a split in the white community. Part of white owners said it's important to actually have them convert over to Christianity because then we can use it as a tool to keep them enslaved. The other said, no, don't do that because if they're now Christians like us, they're gonna think that they should be free like us. But then this one guy said, no, we'll just tell them they're free in spirit, not in physical. Okay, does that answer your question? I wanted to talk about the uh, schooling that you talked about earlier about how if the schools are the reason that a lot of the kids are dropping out and that uh, it is the reason why a lot of people are not succeeding in that institution. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of wondering, isn't it kind of like a balance of both like school and family life? Because what about those individuals who go to school that actually want to do good, but mm -hmm. since they got to go home to a traumatizing environment, you mm -hmm. know, which sets their foundation, it kind of takes away their um, energy yeah. that they put into school. Yeah. That's kind of what was my question. Yeah. So I was Great. So when, what, you, what you caught me talking about in particular was about how there is a lack of education in those schools that reflect people learning about themselves. And then I went on to talk about, you know, how these schools are also, you know, poorly funded or whatnot. I think it is a partnership, right? I think it is a partnership. But I do think that, that when you send your child to a school, you should, you should be able to send your child to a school knowing that it's a safe place. 
knowing that they're going to get educated, knowing that teachers are committed. You, those are the things that you should hope, right? Um, but I would agree it's a partnership. But there are a lot of schools that are failing. And I think institutionally, a lot of parents don't have the economic ability to be able to send their child to the best school. So if we just did understand that schools are funded by the tax dollars in their community. So a poor community is going to have poor schools. Wealthy community has wealthy schools. And then private schools sit on the cusp. Private schools are usually in the middle of the area where it's poor or you know somewhat middle class or upper middle class. But you can have an affluent school in an affluent community that has a a, a better like better access, better resources than a private school. And so I think that there's disparities because of economics that plays a part in the treatment and also the access that students have. And so yes, it should be a partnership, but I think it's unfair that you have certain populations of people <coughs> that are exposed to schools that are poorly resourced, and then other populations that reflect the dominant culture that don't have those same experiences and have to be less concerned about their children and their children's welfare. So like a lot of people say that they love each other, but they don't necessarily, their actions don't really show that. I feel like it's just a lot of talking and going around in the black community about, oh, I love this person, I love that person, but that same person to be the same one to stab you in your back. Absolutely. So I feel like, you know, a lot of black people specifically have like a wrong definition of what it is to love each other. So, you know, that was just kind of my two cent on how I feel like, you know, the state of the black family can change. I appreciate that. Does anybody else want to chime in on this before I end? On this, anybody else have any thoughts, ideas? Yes. Well, uh, you know, I, I brought our child development class, and one of the things we really are, uh, we work with how do we nurture, care for, and mm -hmm. educate children zero to eight, yes. the critical period. And I think so much of what has been presented today is so important for my students to understand that we have to work on our stuff first to be able to really serve these children well. Yes to yeah. understand them, to understand, like you said, the strengths of their families. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to take the model of early care and education to elementary and middle school, because it tends to be a more nurturing model. Yes. And then you get to elementary, and schools really start to fail kids yeah. even yeah. more so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I think there should be some studies around that, like really begin to explore like what happens at that time period where you go you know, from basically grew to middle school like what is happening in middle school that begins to shift children's experiences why does the model change because I would agree I think it is more nurturing and I don't think that children need less nurturing as they get older I think they need more um, I think yeah different it, it might need to shift like what it is but I think the nurture needs to continue so for me I think the way that we change the state of the black family is deepening an understanding of cultural identity deepening an understanding of cultural identity. When you know yourself, then you're at the forefront of how you live. Dr. Linda James Meyer said that people need to achieve optimal psychology. She's talking about optimal health. She says that it's important that if you want to have the best health, that you have a worldview that reflects your ancestry. One, a worldview reflects your ancestry. She says you shouldn't have a worldview that reflects CNN or the school that you went to. Your worldview should reflect your ancestry. That means that you have to learn about who you are, culturally, historically, and in modern day. She says you also need rituals that reflect your ancestry. What are rituals? Rituals are practices, things you engage in every day. If you live in America, there are rituals that you're given on the daily that don't reflect who you are. So individualism, being concerned about who you are, me, myself, and I, that's a Western concept. That, 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 that concept in itself is an antithesis. It's opposite of the existence and healthiness of African people. Another thing I tell you is, is like a materialism, consumption. We all in here are guilty of having too much of something that we don't need. Somebody in here has multiple baseball caps for no apparent reason, only got one head. We all got closet full of shoes, only one pair of feet. Multiple jackets, only one body. 
But that's a part of this society because this society says that the more stuff you have, the more valuable you are. I'm going to say that again because I don't know if y'all's paying attention. The more stuff that you have, the more valuable you are. This is why people spend money on stuff they don't need because they want somebody to say, you valuable. She says you need rituals that reflect who you are. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. Don't want anybody to get upset. But I also tell people I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. So it's not my job to make you feel good. My job is to make you think. Thanksgiving, Christmas, those are rituals that reflect this society. It does not reflect African people. They're rituals that reflect this society, not African people. But think about this. Even if you don't celebrate Christmas, the only thing you can eat on Christmas Day, if you're not trying to eat what people prepared, the only thing that's open is what? Chinese food. That's the only thing that's open. But the rituals of this society governs this society. So even if you don't believe in it, the rituals make you have to be conform to what's happening here. They say environments impact and control how you show up. This happens all the time. So she said you need rituals to reflect your ancestry, things that will feed who you are. And then she said you need to be spirit-centered. Spirit-centered, not material-centered. means that you do things that give to your spirit on the daily. She's not talking about religion. When we hear spirit, we often, often think about religion. She's saying spirit. Spirit is that thing, that, the energy that runs through your body. How many folks have woke up on the wrong side of the bed? It's like, uh, something's a little off, I don't feel like myself. Show of hands. Yeah. Anybody ever had like one of those good hugs, like you hug somebody and you're like, oh, that feels so good? That's energy. That's energy. Somebody can call you right now and you pick up the phone and be like, ooh, I shouldn't have picked up. You're like, dang, I shouldn't have picked up. That's energy, right? She said, feed your spirit. But what she's offering is a deepening understanding of who you are culturally. Now, as Hill Harper said, I will say that we are not a monolithical. We are not all the same. That there are differences amongst African people. But knowing who you are is something that can grow us as a people. Some of the pain that we see in the community is people not being connected to who they are. And so I will offer that as a stepping stone. And so I tell all my students, learn about who you are. Study who you are. Students that are going into these fields, study who you are so you know who you are when you come and start working with black families. This is important because no matter what type of work you do, your perception, your lens will inform how you treat people. Make sense? Appreciate you all. Yeah.